You know, there's an interesting illustration in my way of thinking out of the Royal Commission of Inquiry into the banking and the financial services. And people say, isn't it great that we had that and we discovered how terrible it all is and now we've got 78 new recommendations all involving more policing, more law, more penalties and had to deal with the situation. No, uh, in my view is it would have been far better if people had done what they ought to have done and didn't need to be coerced. Hmm. We think the answer is more and more laws and we now know we're paying an economic price for it because it's been jamming up the financial system. This, this approach, when people won't do what they ought to do, guided by a broadly accepted sort of set of moral norms, yes. I, I think you're suggesting to us that as a historian, to cut ourselves off from our past and its understanding, if you like, of a common set of basic um, moral precepts and understandings including, I think, a deep commitment to the idea that we have to respect our neighbours, even if we disagree with them, that's largely washed out. That that loss of history is a big part of our problem? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, one of the things that strikes me so much as a historian um, of ideas broadly is that there is such a contemporary furor in public debate about religious liberty, and yet there is so little knowledge of by the very people who are participating in public debate often, of our own history in Australia, of yeah. the idea of freedom of religion, what that has meant and what it hasn't meant. Yeah. Um, and I think you see it in particular, like one example I think is really egregious is that there is a particular misunderstanding of what it means to live in a secular state. So one of the things, one of the ideas that you'll find in the public discussion of religious freedom all the time is that because Australia is a secular state, uh, Therefore, there'll be no discussion of religion in the public sphere. And yet, historically, that's not what no, Section 116 not, of the Constitution... And it's not even a, it's not a history yeah. either. It's not a history. We're, we're not a secular country. We have a secular system of government which knows no religious truth but treats religions equally and neutrally. But the government doesn't ignore the fact that there are religious people in the country and religious organisations and institutions. It just has to handle them even-handedly. Yes. Yeah, and, 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 and the idea that we're a secular society and therefore religion must be out of the public square is a, is a, is a fiction mm -hmm. uh, and a myth created by secularists who would like that to be the case, yeah. yes, I think. Yeah. You, see, you see that tradition historically in France, very much part of the aftermath of the terror of the French Revolution. Um, but that's not the case in Australia. It's not what religious liberty has meant in Australian history. And moreover, actually, one of the fascinating things about exploring the history of ideas about religious liberty in Australia is that actually ideas of religious freedom have been used by and helped to protect groups that we have actually completely overlooked and would actually startle people if they knew. I think one of the most um, amazing examples of this is that in 1927, you have really possibly the earliest articulation of the idea that Indigenous Australians have basically a kind of religious freedom, a right to the sacred sacred objects and sacred places of worship that are there. So what happens in 1927 is that there are some stones, Chirunga stones, uh, sacred stones that belong to the Arunta people in Central Australia. And through dubious means, probably they were stolen. They end up in Melbourne because it's the late 1920s. There's, there's a discussion in public debate like, okay, so what happens to these stones? Uh, should they go to a museum? Uh, there are arguments that they can be bought and sold on the private market. But then interestingly enough, the Aborigines Friends Association, uh, so Indigenous people, but also, fascinatingly enough, uh, supported by non-Indigenous supporters, chief among whom is the Evangelical Anglican Archbishop of Melbourne, Harrington Lees, and a, an Evangelical uh, Baptist minister. And they actually make the argument that the Arunta stones ought to be returned to the Arunta people. And the argument's essentially a religious liberty argument. It is saying what they argue in, in the press is that they ought to be returned because they are objects that are sacred to the Arunta people and that they ought to be afforded, therefore, the same rights of those sacred objects in the same way that a cathedral, and that's actually literally the image that they use, in the same way that a cathedral is sacred to Christians. And this is such a fascinating example, I think, of the way that actually religious liberty in Australia has an incredibly rich history. And it's been used by people, including, for example, Indigenous Australians, to make arguments for a variety of religious rights of people, not just Christians, obviously, but Indigenous people too, um, and non-Christians, actually, um, and even atheists.
So you're painting a picture here of religious freedom being something much more than the person in the street probably realises as they think of an arcane debate in, in Canberra. You know, they're thinking, oh, this is about that unusual bloke down the road who, you know, who wants to go and stand on the street corner and hand out pamphlets. Let him do it. He's harmless. Or, you know, um, so-and-so up the street who's, whose daughter's uh, gone off to be a missionary. I think that's a bit odd why they're wasting their lives doing that, but we, you shouldn't stop them. It goes far deeper to the shaping of the Australia that we love. Yes. As part of in the, in the, in the Western tradition. You're not even meant to talk about a Western tradition anymore, but I don't see how you can get away from it as a useful understanding of the Judeo-Christian influences in the democracies. There are roughly 180 countries in the world today Around 42 or three of them could be called democracies, all bar three or four of them started out profoundly influenced by the Christian faith. And the three or four have been influenced more recently. Think Hong Kong, think Thailand, Taiwan, think North Korea, Singapore. Um, and yet that's airbrushed out as though Christianity's always been the problem, not the foundational sort of... Um, ethos, you know, love your neighbour, yeah. even when you disagree with them, everyone has dignity, everyone has worth. All of that's airbrushed out. And this is part of this loss of historical understanding, it seems to me. It seems to me to be very problematic. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.